Life Her Podcast. Hey, you. Her is me, her is you. Her is us, her is she, her is we. United we stand, baby, that her for keeps. I'm coming and I demand my space, I know it's free. I owe myself the world, they tried to count me out. Hopping down some dark roads, they tried to pound me out. From cloudy to sunny, ain't think that I would make it out. I need a positive emotions to fill me out. Hey, everyone, this is Life Her Podcast, Yvette Lloyd. I am here with Tysha Presley. Hey, Tysha, how are you? Hey, you said I'm good. And yourself? I'm good, girl. Just getting the day started. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. On a late night. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yes, definitely. So tell me a little bit about yourself. So I am um, an owner of this company called Legacy Empowerment Services, and it's a private practice. I actually just hired um, a contract therapist and she's working with me we work with adolescents and young adults who have experienced some type of dysfunction um, and I, I I tell people all the time that dysfunction everybody has a degree of dysfunction right so dysfunction mm-hmm. is like on a spectrum and so I work with people that have experienced some type some form of dysfunction and they want to do what I call rehabilitate their lives I mean they just want to get it together so <laughs> Uh, it could be getting it together because they have relationship issues, because they have issues with themselves, parenting issues, co-parenting issues, relationship with um, issues with food and their body image. They just want to get their lives together in some type of way because of how their dysfunctional upbringing affected them. So that's what I do. And I do it because I am someone who has experienced a dysfunctional upbringing. And so I know firsthand how it can really affect you and really destroy your life if you're not very intentional and careful about what you do to kind of resolve those types of issues in your life. Wow, that is amazing. You know, sometimes a lot of us um, don't even recognize the different things that we need rehab on in our personal lives also. So I Mm -hmm. feel like it's amazing that you're doing something like this. Mm -hmm. So, um, could you please let me know? I'm very curious. So during pandemic, you know, everyone, um, suffered a lot of financial hardship, mental illness, anything as far as, um, having deaths in different families. What is the biggest need that you have experienced this past year of us going through the pandemic? So, um, I work with a lot of parents, right? Um, and, you know, parents have been really going through it because our kids have been home and we're trying to balance our kids being home. We're trying to balance our own work schedule and our own stuff. And what I found is that with our parents, um, because the pandemic, you know, when you're in crisis, like all you, I mean, you're like in this state of trigger, like you're just triggered, right? And you're in this state of distress and it turns into chronic stress. And so what I found is that people are just like really triggered right now. And that spills over into their relationship with their kids and with their um, significant others. Um, And so just really um, the pandemic slowed us down enough to realize that, wait a minute, I got some stuff I need to work on. And so I found that a lot of people are coming into counseling because they have been able to slow down and not be distracted by like stuff that were that good stuff, even stuff that were good that we consider good, like work and you know just hanging out. Um, but it's like the pandemic took all of that away, and so when all, when everything gets stripped from you, you really find out what's actually going on within you. And so people started going within and and actually wanting to do the work because now they had time. And so that kind of um, the pandemic it, it brought a lot of bad things, but I think that's one of the most beautiful things. Um, that the pandemic brought um, because it brought people a sense of clarity. It brought um, people a sense of um, understanding about themselves and a sense of wanting to actually resolve things. And so I think that the pandemic in and of itself was bad, but it was such a blessing in a lot of different ways as well. Wow. Cause I was curious, cause you know, what people losing family members, it seemed like, you know, basically every day we're losing somebody. You know, somebody in the world is losing someone. And 
it's just heartbreaking to see it and then knowing some people expect it or they in fear of it because once they say, oh, such and such got COVID and it's like, oh God, the first thing we think of was praying that they won't pass away from it. So, yeah. you know, that's that's kind of hard, especially when you see everyone else losing a special someone and then it end up getting close to home and it's a different experience, you know? It is a different experience, and it really um, teaches you to not take relationships for granted and not take your life for granted. And I think that sometimes even um, just kind of um, pre, pre-pandemic, we really took a lot of things for granted. Uh, we took our time here for granted. We took, you know, opportunities for granted. And I think that now you see, like, all these businesses just sprouting up, right? You see people on their on their grind. Like, they are, like, really driven right now. And I think that that's a beautiful thing as well because we've been taught that life is really just a vapor. And we just don't know when our time will come. And it teaches us to really hone in and not take things for granted. And that includes our life and that includes our opportunities and includes our purpose. And so I think that is another beautiful thing that this pandemic has done because it helped us to see that, you know what, we really have a great opportunity here and we need to really take advantage of it. And I think that's something that's beautiful, actually. Girl, yes. And you know, a lot of people was um, either getting close to whoever their higher power is also. Because, yeah. you yeah. know, along the way, we forget things. And, you know, life goes on in so many ways. But I've noticed a lot of people is a lot more consistent with it now. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I absolutely agree. And and a lot of people are, are, are too questioning their faith. And I think that sometimes we get afraid of um, questioning God, especially. But I think that when we question God, it opens us up to kind of get closer to God. And God is not, you know, and I, I hate to get on this spiritual kind of conversation, but I think that it's relevant um, because I don't think that God is afraid of the hard questions. And so if you or anyone finds themselves questioning God about anything, like I want, I, I encourage people because I do, I lean into all of that and I ask God really hard questions and he's not afraid of that. He's God. Right. And so, yeah, I think this pandemic, you know, that's another beautiful thing. All these beautiful things. Right. That's another beautiful thing that we get to ask God hard questions like, God, why the death? Why the losses? And I think that in those questions, um, there comes like a process that we go through where it reveals things about us. It reveals things about life. It re- reveals things about God. But I think that it's important to not be afraid of asking really tough questions. Yes. Um, tough questions are tough. But when we face our fears of having a, during those tough moments, we will get answers. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of people, it's hard for them to actually figure it out because either we're stubborn or we're not educated about it for us to know the next step of our lives for us to feel better about our questions to God and believe it or not he answers them if we really stay tuned in and actually get to know ourselves more and and figure things out of how he's communicating with us because he shows us signs Absolutely. And it's not always the way that you think that the answer will come. It can be like, you know, you can be on the beach or just people watching or whatever, and the answer will come by just watching things, right? And so it doesn't always come by reading the Bible, so to speak, or um, by hearing God. I don't hear from God because we're listening with our ears or we're listening with our heart. But sometimes we just listen and we listen through watching nature. And in the Bible talks about how God reveals himself through nature sometimes. And so it's just important to kind of take away like your preset image or preset thoughts of how things will work out and how God will talk to you. And that's where you kind of get the answer by kind of unraveling yourself from all of that. Yes, and that, oh, that is deep. (laughs) But it's the truth though. And and I feel like it's great that we are even having this conversation because it'll help people to gain a better understanding on how to actually build a relationship with God, keep the relationship with him, and also figure out how can we hear him and see the things that we need to see from him. Mm-hmm. That's so good. 
Um, also, um, so what was it like growing up for you? Since I, know, I see that you are a licensed mental health therapist. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure it may have been things that transpired in your personal life that created you to be able to get an education in this field. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so funny. Um, last, I think, it was, I think it was last Sunday, I did a, um, I guess a panel discussion with a group of therapists and the name of that conversation was a healer's journey to healing. Um, and in that discussion, it just allowed therapists to just kind of be human. Sometimes we think that people that are in certain positions are not human and we don't experience certain things that we teach about or that we kind of walk people through. But I am a very, I'm a human being, right? And so in my life, I was, I say I work with people that come from dysfunctional upbringings because I come from a dysfunctional upbringing um, in the sense that my dad was a functional alcoholic who abused my mom um, verbally, emotionally, sometimes even physically. My mom was always at work, so I was the middle child. But even though I was the middle child, I was like, I functioned as the oldest in the sense that I raised my siblings. Um, and so, and I was, I had, I experienced sexual abuse um, growing up. And so I experienced all of that. But I got on this path because I really wanted to understand my father. I just didn't understand him. I didn't understand the, you know, the function of the alcoholism. I didn't understand, you know, why my mom decided to stay. Now I do, but at that time I didn't. Um, and so my path started with my dad. And, you know, it's interesting because I believe that fathers give purpose. And I always thought that my father didn't really give me purpose. He didn't really speak into my life. Like it wasn't a traditional father um, daughter relationship, but in even my father passed a, um, a couple of years, maybe six years ago. Um, but even in his death, he is the one that kind of got me to where I am in terms of my purpose because I did this so I could understand him. So um, I went to college, studied psychology, and that led me to getting a master's in rehabilitation counseling with a um, specialty in addiction. And then I started working with people that have addictions, and I was like, these people are crazy. <laughs> they are stuck. They do not want help. So let me not work with them anymore. And so I started working with kids. Um, and then I was like, okay, uh, they are right. And then somehow I ended up working with the children of um, alcoholics and the children of dysfunction. And so that's where I am now. This is my lane. Like, I love this lane that I'm in now. And it's just a culmination of years, like 20 years of just working, trying to understand, healing myself through this whole journey, through relationships and parenting and everything has gotten me where I am today. And I love where I am today because um, I talked to you earlier today about how people recognize me because of my experiences, because my experiences um, shape who I am. And so I can like just talk and people are like, yeah, I need to work with you <laughs> because you got something I need. But it's all because of what I've been through in my life. And so that is how I got to where I am now, through dysfunction. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell me um, as far as how did you feel witnessing your father do things like that to your mother? How did it make you feel? Um, so it made me angry, but not in the way that you would think. So I, you would think that I would be angry with my dad, right? Because he's the one that was the abuser. But no, somehow I identified more with my father and I was upset with my mother. And for me, I was upset with my mom because I'm like, well, how could you allow him to treat you this way? How could you allow your kids to see all of this? And I, I would call her names. Like I would say she's weak. I would be the one that would be yelling at her when my father is the one that was the abuser. Um, and so, and it's just interesting because I always said to myself that I would just never be like my mom. And so what ended up happening in my life was that because I identified more with him, I actually became a little bit more abusive. And so I had this relationship, the major, major relationship in my life. Um, I actually began abusing him verbally not physically but verbally emotionally and that's because I identify with that and I never wanted to be considered weak like my mom and so how do I feel I felt like I was powerful when I took on the characteristics of my father 
And so I, that, in that, within that relationship, it taught me a lot about myself and it taught me a lot about just growth and how my past affected me. But to answer your question, it felt, it felt horrible seeing my mom abused, but I felt angry at her and not necessarily my dad. Is that, did that answer your question? It does. And that's, and that's so like odd, but yet typical because it's either way, a child usually pick up a habit from either parent, the abuser mm-hmm. or the one that's being abused. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, um, it's very enlightening to actually hear you say that because sometimes people pick up the opposite and they date like a woman, a woman dates a man that was exactly like their father or whomever their mother was dating and they become, start being an abusive relationship. Yet you were the a verbal abuser. Yeah. In this aspect. That's the exact opposite. Yep. And it took me, like, I'm just now, Yvette, I'm just now getting to the place where <laughs> I can actually be healthy in a relationship. It's taken some time because I had to, you know, talk about unraveling, I had to rehabilitate my perspective of what is healthy, of what is loving, what is kind, what is a relationship, right? How do you function in a relationship when you never saw a relationship, a healthy relationship? And so it took me a time. It took, I call it practice. It takes practice. Um, and so that's what I had to do for most of my life, like just kind of unlearn a lot of my learning. And I did that by practicing with someone that was more healthy than I was. When did you actually realize that you were the abuser, the verbal abuser? Like what age did you figure that out and wanted so, to help yourself? Yeah. So um, it, it was through that early childhood relationship. And I said early childhood. I was more of an adult. I, um, that relationship started when I was in 2001, like right when I graduated college. Um, I graduated college. I met this guy that I fell in love with and we got engaged and, um, you know, yeah, we were in a relationship for like two years of me, like he was in love with me and I was in love with him, but I was abusive. And at the end of the day, we were in the relationship for about maybe two years. At the end of the day, he ended the relationship because he chose himself and he said, I don't. And so here's the catch. Here's the funny, the interesting thing. The interesting thing is that I knew that I would, I wanted to be healthy. I just did not know how to be healthy. And so I remember asking him, I remember saying to him, don't leave me because I know that I'll get better. And he said, I have to leave you because I don't know if I can be in this relationship with you and still be okay. And so I respected what he was saying, but it really hurt. And when that relationship ended, it was that relationship ending that helped. You know how people say you got to hit your rock bottom? I think that was my rock Girl, bottom. Oh, yeah. Wow. I think, that was, I think that was my rock bottom because it was the relationship ending that helped me say, you know what? I think you got a problem, girl. <laughs> I think you got a problem that you need to learn how to solve it. And so that is what kind of took me on the journey, the quote unquote journey to rehabilitate my life um, because he had the courage that although he loved me, he chose himself. And so I tell people that sometimes you do have to choose yourself. Sometimes, you know, there, there is a time and a place to walk with people on their journey and you have to know where you are in yourself to know whether or not you can help somebody because, you know, you're not anyone's punching back either. Right. And so I teach yep. this thing called, I teach this thing called loving people to wholeness. Um, and I believe it, but I think that there's a fine balance because you can love someone to wholeness, but you can be destroying yourself and you have to know which one it is and know when to let go. And he had the courage to let go. And I really, you know, he's, you know, he's my friend now, actually. And so now I look back and I'm like, thank you for leaving me. <laughs> thank, you for leaving me. thank you for leaving me because that is, that is what, um, that was my rock bottom and it helped me to actually find myself. So I really appreciate it in retrospect, but at the time I ain't like it. I wasn't here for it <laughs> at all. I was not here for it at all. But wow. in the end it worked out. So when did you find yourself actually healing and facing your your fears, your issues that you had? Because, you know, sometimes we don't face reality. 
because mm-hmm. we and we be we find ourselves being in denial on the things that we need help with and we will make excuses constantly mm-hmm. over and over again and it'll make us feel better but what was it what was your breaking point to you to actually realize like look I need to get myself together I need to do this and do that so I can be able to you know be someone's wife or be in another mm-hmm. relationship without being an abuser yeah so so my i so that was my breaking point that was my my rock bottom um but it took some time before i actually so my so i i got saved like right before um i got into that relationship so my journey started with christ and and so i started kind of i had like a well i got admit to a lot <laughs> so um, so right when I got saved, like I had some struggles with some with depression as well. And so like God walked me through like my own struggles with depression and self-esteem and worth because I didn't think I was worthy, like all of that stuff. And so he brought like a woman of God in my life that helped me to not kill myself. Um, and she kind of walked me through this whole process of deliverance. I don't know if you are Christian. I don't know what your faith is, but in I'm my Christian. Mind, Okay, good. So in my world, we kind of believe in this whole process of deliverance. And so after I got saved, I went through this years and years and years of like this deliverance. And what that really just meant for me was um, becoming different by learning, unlearning some of the stuff that I had learned and breaking the agreement that I had with my past and with the thoughts that I had believed. And so that was my process of deliverance. And so throughout that process, um, I had people that came in my life, and I think that it's really important that you, I say that we healed and we become whole in community because that has been my experience. And so throughout that process, I met this young lady who came in my life, and she was really kind and sweet, but I didn't trust her because I didn't trust nobody, <laughs> right? And so one day I went up to her, and I was like, well, would you be my practice husband? And that sounds really weird. But I asked her, you know, I don't, I said, I don't know how to be healthy and I need someone to just practice with me because I want to get married one day and I want to have a healthy, good marriage. I don't want to break up. And so I said, would you practice with me? Would you help me to just love, learn how to love? And she was like, okay. And she did. (laughs) And I literally just practiced with her. And what that means when I say practice, what I mean by that is that I just would allow myself to become vulnerable. So when I was triggered, I would say it, and we would work through it. I learned how to argue fear. I learned how to not, um, um, I I just learned how to be healthy. Yes, I'm going to say that. I just learned how to be healthy. So all the ways that I was unhealthy, all the ways that I was abusive, I unlearned that in practice. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes a lot of sense. But even though you were going through those different transition transitions in your life didn't it feel good when you reached the point where you admitted that you were you know unhealthy in that area and you overcame it and then you find something else but just even continuing on finding new things and you face it and then you make a you become a better you don't that feel good it did not feel good actually okay <laughs> It did not feel good. And I'm going to tell you why it did not feel good. It didn't feel good because I had so much stuff going on. And so eventually I felt like, damn, another thing, something else. I felt like I was so broken. And so every time I made progress in one area, something else would pop up and I would feel bad about it. I would feel bad about myself. And I felt like I really am jacked up. Wow. <laughs> like I really am not worth it. I'm re- so I started like, I like this whole, like a lot of the process that I'm talking about, it took years, like 20 years, right? Oh yeah. And it takes a long time. <laughs> it takes a very long time. Like it's not an automatic thing. So I'm I'm talking to you, we're like twenty minutes in a conversation, but this was this is like twenty years I'm talking about. Um and so within those twenty years, no, it did not feel good. It felt like hell. 
it felt like hell. It felt like my life was broken. It felt like I was scrambled eggs on the inside. It felt like I was weak. It felt like I was just vulnerable. It did not feel good. I did not like myself during the process. Like I used to listen to Joyce Meyer all the time. I would read Joyce Meyer books and she's the one that taught me how to love myself in the journey. She's the one that taught me that I could actually like myself and still not have it all together. <laughs> but that was even a process to actually understanding that. I did not think that even God loved me because I did not know that. I did not understand that. I thought that I was so broken that God did not like me. And so this pro this process is not easy. And I think that um, even I think that sometimes people have those feelings and they feel so broken that they just stop. They stop trying to work on themselves. They stop trying to grow because it is so uncomfortable. And that's why they don't grow. Because there is, is, there is, there's so much, it is so uncomfortable. It is so uncomfortable. But it is in that uncomfortability. I don't even know if that's the word. But it is. Are we making it more? <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> it, it, it is in all of that that you grow. And so I work with clients now, and they're like, Ty, I don't want to do this. Here we are again. And I'm like, I know it's hard. I, I mean, I'm not, I know, but yeah. you do if you, if you want, if you want, to, if you, when you close your eyes, you see how you want to be like, you see it, you can see it. Don't stop until you become that person that when you close your eyes, that you can just, like when you, you can see that person. So don't stop until you become that person. That's what I tell people. And that's how I kept going. Like, I just had hope that at one day, and you know, and here's the thing, like, there's no, like, arrival. <laughs> like, I'm, al I'm always a work in process. Like, there's no finish line. And so forever you will be ever evolving. And so, but don't stop until that person that you see in your head becomes your reality. And that is what I keep in mind. And that's what keeps me going. Even now, someone that is, I've been in the field for 18 years. I've been working on myself for 18 years, over 18 years. And I'm still not that person. So I still keep going. And that's, and that's what it is. That is amazing. And mm -hmm. you know what's so crazy when I was asking you, didn't it feel good to yourself? It, it, I felt the opposite. It felt good to me because of the fact that I know I overcame something, but I always mm -hmm. knew it was something else going to come up. Mm -hmm. So, so now that I'm older, when I experience hardship and things transpire in my life, I know to calm myself down. Yeah. And, and let it flow and let myself be able to embrace those feelings so I won't experience it again. That's good. And I think, you know what, I think that now I think I'm at a level of healthiness, a level of health where I can be in that space that you're talking about. But in the beginning, that's not what I experienced. It just isn't. Um, and I and I think that and I think that for some people that may be listening, they may if they were honest with themselves, they would say that they kind of bear witness to what I'm saying. But and I'm and I'm I I, I love that I can be honest and say that no, it didn't feel good. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, know I it didn't feel good to me either in the beginning. But I mm -hmm. once I became wiser and understood yeah. God mm -hmm. more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It helped me understand it more because it's like we experience, you know, similarities to the things that God experienced all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if he can get through it, why can't we? Yeah. <laughs> and I, he's dealing with more people agree. than us. I absolutely <laughs> agree. I absolutely agree. Now, I think that now I can see it that way. Now I can. Initially, I couldn't. But now I can't. I, I absolutely agree with you. Now, now if, you know, I, I had um, this person I was telling you about that was my practice. I call her my practice husband. She's a girl. And <laughs> uh -huh. I'm not, you know, you know, but, you know, she's my practice husband. That's who, that's who right. I call her. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I remember, like, there, there are times that we now, we may have an argument, but we don't fall out because now we're healthier. And that feels good now. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, that feels really good when I can, um, when we can express ourselves 
and I can I don't internalize what she says and she doesn't internalize what I say. We just you know, we're just we disagree. Like you're entitled to your opinion, right? And so mm-hmm. I love that. I love that. Yes, that feels great now. It does. But that took some time. This is like this is years in the making. It took some time to get there. Yes. I already know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. Yeah. Now, as far as um you dealing with depression and wanting to kill yourself, what got you to that point? Because you dealt with so many things as far as your father and your mother and then your um ex-fiance and then mm-hmm. you end up becoming depressed and wanting to kill yourself. What, mm-hmm. what transpired to make those things trigger into your personal life for you to actually feel that way? Yeah, so my breaking point was college, girl. <laughs> my breaking point was college. I Goodness. was in junior year, senior year in college where they expect you to have your life figured out. And I did not have my life figured out. And um, I was in this period. I, I remember I tell this story all the time. Not all the time, but sometimes I tell this story. Uh, when my junior senior year in college, I used to be really depressed. I would lock myself in my room. I would do just enough so that they wouldn't call the police on me <laughs> and say, where is she? I literally, this is going to sound gross, but I literally would have a bucket in my in my room and I would use the bathroom in my room. And then like one time a day, I would go and, and you know, put it in the toilet. But that sounds gross, but that's how bad it got. I would leave the blinds closed. Like I was depressed. Like I was gone. And um, I would listen to sad music and, you know, all that stuff. Um, but it, it got triggered because of college. And, um, and yeah, like the pressure, the pressures of college, the pressure of life, trying to have it all figured out and just realizing that I did not, um, not feeling enough. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what brought it on. That's what brought it on. I know that was a lot on you. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, so would you? So, the fact that you were, you were in school to become a therapist. I was in school studying psychology, and my minor was business. Wow. So, with you in school studying psychology and going through those things, did you learn different things while you were in school and be like, "Wow, this is me." Yeah. So, no, I didn't. Um, and so you would think I did, right? But I mm. didn't. And, and, you know, I don't know that I was aware enough to actually get it. And I may have, they may have taught me this stuff, but I don't think that I was in a place, I don't think I was stable enough. Per, let me use that word. I don't think I was stable enough to actually get it all and to actually apply it and make sense of it. And so um, I think that in college, they don't necessarily do enough outreach and mental wellness stuff because there are a lot of college students that are struggling. Like I work with college students now too. And so there are a lot of college students that are struggling and they don't know that they're depressed. I didn't know that I was depressed. And yeah, these things on a book, you know, talk to me about theory and all that stuff, but like life, life application is different than theory. Um, And so, yeah, I, I I don't, I can't say that I really knew. Wow. You know, you know, I'm glad that you're saying all of this because, you know, sometimes people believe that because you're a mental health therapist, you always had it all together. Mm -mm. (laughs) You know, sometimes people think that you guys don't deal with things, too, but you have to do the things to make yourself better for you to be Mm -hmm. able to help someone else, too. Yeah, every single thing that I teach my clients, I have, I practice it. Like every single thing I am, I call myself my first and my favorite client because I practice everything every single day. And so I wouldn't teach it if I didn't believe it, that it works. And so I I literally use everything on myself first (laughs) all the time. Wow. And and it, it literally is a practice. It is a practice. Yes, it is. And it takes mm-hmm. a lot of practice, too. <laughs> a lot of practice. A lot of practice. Yes, it does. It takes a whole lot. So mm-hmm. now that you have dealt with so many 
obstacles in life. Where are you right now today in your life? I'm in a good place right now. I'm in a good place. Um, and I say that I'm in a good place because I am very much aware of myself. And and when I say I'm in a good place, that doesn't mean that everything is perfect. It just means that I'm aware and I, I practice mindfulness and I use my skills and that's what gets me through. That's what helps me. But I am so much farther along than when I was 20, what, 17, 18, 19 years old, that uh, junior, senior in college. I have come such a long way, such a long way. And I am so proud of this lady that I am right now. Um, and like I said earlier, there is no, to me, there's no finish line. That is, I don't, I don't believe there's a finish line. So, and what that means is that I'll get better every day, but I am proud of the work that I've done. I'm proud Girl, of it. I'm proud of so, you too. So proud of it. I am proud. I am, I am, I'm proud of myself. I really am. I really, really am. That's good. And I'm, not, and I'm, and I'm, I'm proud. Perfect, but I'm proud. Mm-hmm. De- definitely and you know it's it's a good feeling to feel proud of yourself knowing that you've come so far and sometimes we are we come far in many things but we be so hard on ourselves and we really mm-hmm. don't notice it so it's mm-hmm. like okay let me sit back and think about all the things that I have done what I've accomplished how far I come I beat this I beat that, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's yep. to a mm-hmm. point where we don't really just sit and analyze and figure out like, wow, I am further along in life. And I think a lot of us need to sit down and do that. And I, and it's the best feeling ever once we actually realize who we are and what we did for ourselves. So true. So true. And you know what I also <laughs> helps is when I first got saved, that you know how you get those prophetic words i got like a lot of prophetic words like people would just walk up to me and say different things Mm -hmm. and even without me trying to make those things happen i feel sometimes proud when i see that they happen (laughs) without me even trying and i see that you know god would say you're going to do this and you're going to be this and you're going you know and those things are coming they have come to pass and there are so many things that are still coming to pass and that makes me really happy too I ain't like, I'm not even gonna lie. It makes me happy. <laughs> That's yeah. good. You're supposed mm-hmm. to feel happy though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the whole concept of it all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. To see that it was spoken and to see it come to pass. It's amazing. It really Girl, is. Girl, tell me about it. <laughs> and then and then it makes it and it makes it like, oh, that's why. <laughs> that's I why. know. It just makes I know. it make sense. It makes it make sense. A whole lot of sense. Have you don't it feel like I don't know, I be feeling some kind of way once I meet someone that been through something I've been through and I'd be like, oh yeah, this is up my alley. Yeah, I can help yes. you with this. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that's what I said, like my clients, like my clients, they they be like, it's something about you. <laughs> like you like you my girl. Like I that that's my therapist. And I'm like, yeah, I know it. Like I, I listen for like when I first meet a client, I listen for certain words and the words that I always hear is something to the effect of I need to break a generational curse. Uh, they talk about their family like, and I'm like, Yep, you found the right person. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You found the right person, but it makes everything make sense, and it, I'm, I, it, I get like a sense of joy because you know I'm like I didn't go for, go through all of this for nothing, right? Mm-hmm. It makes me happy. It really does make me happy. Girl, yes. And mm-hmm. then you know, just even just seeing how people overcome things, and you just know that you help them overcome that. It's mm-hmm. like yes, I saved the life. And they have a different perspective on theirs now. It just, it's a good, refreshing feeling. Yeah, it it absolutely is. It absolutely is. Yes. So tell me about Hello Body. Mm-hmm. Oh, where do I start? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, all, so everything kind of, Hello Body is like a combination of like a lot of the things that I mentioned tonight. And um, because, like, on the cover, you see a picture of me, and it says, I am enough. A lot of the things that I've been through made me feel like I was not enough. 
And because I grew up in a space, in a family that we didn't really talk about our feelings, right? Um, I kind of stuffed all that and I ate my feelings. <laughs> and with eating your feelings, you gain weight, right? <laughs> and mm-hmm. so I like my weight has gone up and down throughout all of this. And because we wear our feelings, we wear our experiences, sometimes, a lot of the times, most of the time, on our body. And, you know, having been someone that experienced sexual abuse and all that kind of stuff, um, it just made me feel like I wasn't enough. And it made me, it made me um, attribute certain thoughts to my body. And so, hello, body, do you hear me now? It's kind of like a exploration of why and how you look at your body because a lot of us don't like our body because of what we've experienced because of our thinking and hello body helps you kind of explore all of that and that kind of i had to use some of the principles in the journal it's a journal in the journal to kind of unravel some of that for myself and so that's what the journal is about just helping you to love your body as it is explore why you may not love your body and how to make peace with it that's what the book is about wow so how can someone purchase your journal it's a 21 day journal right it's a 21 day guided journal it literally walks you through a process of just loving your body more and and understanding why you may not love it um and just you know changing your thinking in regards to how you see it see your body okay and you um you have it on amazon right it is on amazon um you can go to my website which is www.rehabilitateyourlife.com it's listed on there as well you can purchase it from the website if you want a direct link to purchase the book it is um, bit.ly forward slash hello body journal so bit.ly forward slash hello body journal Okay, perfect. So what you create in this journal, do you give it to your clients? I do. I give it to my clients. And I actually, I do workshops for girls, big and old. So it's, you know, a little girl inside all of us, right? Mm-hmm. All of us old girls. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, I do workshops for girls, big and old, to help them to kind of explore body image issues and Uh, their perspective about their bodies and so yeah I love it I give it to my clients I do the workshops I do lives and um, workshops and everything so yeah it's 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 a beautiful thing it really really is a beautiful thing to help people because of and in light of some of the things that I've experienced wow so when you were going through that experience of eating and you find yourself gaining weight like when did you when did you realize it became an issue? I realized that it became okay. So I have done a little bit of everything to lose weight and to keep it off, including surgery. I've had weight loss surgery too. Um, I realized that it be, it was a thing in terms of emotional eating when my father passed away about six years ago. Um, I had lost about 126 pounds and I kept it off for about four years. And that's, you know, people don't be doing that, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I kept it off for about four years, and then my dad passed. And I remember that night, I wasn't hungry, but I had a family member ask me, I bought, she said, I, uh, this person said, I bought some pizza. Do you want some pizza? I was not hungry, but I remember saying, oh, well, and I got the pizza, and I ate, and I kept eating, I kept eating, I kept eating. And in that eating, it was me dealing with the grief and the loss that I experienced because not that me and my dad had a great relationship because we didn't have a great relationship. It was the regret of what I lost out on. And so me dealing with all of that and feeling all the, all the feelings that I didn't want to say, but I was still experiencing it. So that is what the eating and the weight represented. And so I went from that 126 pound loss and I gained it all back and I gained like another 50 pounds. And so at that point, I think within like a year or less, I was 339 pounds. Wow. And that, yes. And that is when I realized that girl, you got a problem. (laughs) But I knew that I had a problem, but I didn't, I didn't really connect that it was emotional eating. Like it was like kind of a disorder eating, eating Mm -hmm. disorder. Um, and so I didn't really make that connection until that moment. 
because most times we deal with weight issues with just diet and exercise, and we don't deal with it from a, a perspective of mental health and mental wellness. And so I, I have this program called Rehabilitate Your Fitness Journey because, like I said, we always deal with weight issues with diet and exercise instead of dealing with it from mental wellness and mental health. And so now I've shifted my focus from diet and exercise to let me make sure I'm good on the inside. And mm-hmm. when I'm good on the inside, when I'm good on the inside, the weight is not an issue. Me overeating is not an issue because I feel great on the inside. I'm not yes. overeating because I feel good. I'm dealing with my stuff, right? And Girl, so that yeah. Is, yeah, that's so that's what I do. That's what I do now. I, you know, like I said, I have that program for people that kind of struggle in that area as well, uh, because it is a thing. It is a thing. I talk to so many women that don't realize that they're eating because they're not dealing with their stuff. They're not wow. dealing with it. And so that's when you, why the thing. So when you were going through this, what was your biggest struggle? Knowing the fact that you had to lose weight, what was the biggest struggle? Was it like still finding yourself continue to eat food, to exercise, or did you have temptations? What What were you what was the biggest thing that you just like, okay, uh, being being vulnerable. That was the biggest thing because like, I, like I am, like if you grew up in a dysfunctional home, you're most likely a control freak. Okay. (laughs) You like to control because you could not control back then. Mm -hmm. And so I was someone that very much liked to be in control. And whenever I felt out of control, it would be a trigger for me. And so I would pick up, I I, I say pick up food, like it's a drug because it is a drug. (laughs) Food food can sometimes be a drug. And so I would pick up when I felt out of control, when I felt anything that I didn't, that wasn't comfortable for me, I would pick up. And so that was the most, the hardest part is disassociating my need to pick up food instead of just um, dealing with it in a healthy way. So that was the hardest part. It wasn't, I love to exercise. I love to lift weights. Like that was easy. That's the easy part. The hard part is not dealing, not using food as a drug to to cope with your feelings. That was the hard part for me. What being kept you? What being kept being you motivated? What kept you motivate motivated when you were down your weight size to not make it be increased all over again? <laughs> Um, so when I felt like I said, I had weight loss surgery and after, this is after I had lost weight. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just got frustrated. So I said, man, forget this. I'm gonna have the surgery. Just take my stomach. Okay. (laughs) Just take take the stomach. (laughs) All right. But no, but you can still regain on, even after you have weight loss surgery, people, a lot of people do. And so yes. it, while I was in my process of having the weight loss surgery, they found a tumor in my body. And oh. so I was literally like dying from cancer and didn't know it. <laughs> so, oh my God. Yeah. They found this tumor and they took the tumor out and along with the tumor, they, they took a, my spleen and a part of my pancreas. So they started taking organs. And so whenever I think about like going off, I, re- I remember that they started taking organs and I said to myself, Aisha, you are not going to kill yourself with your fork. Wow. You're not, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to let myself die with something that I can control with my fork. And so I transitioned myself to mostly plant-based eating, meaning that I'll, if you see me with a steak and some oxtails, mind your business. <laughs> <laughs> So mostly, mostly plant-based. So on more times than not, I'm eating plant-based. Um, so I transitioned myself to plant-based and I just, you know, I do it because I want to stay alive. I want to stay alive. I have these two beautiful kids, you know, I have this family I want, and I love myself. And right. I look at it now as if how I live my life with my diet and my exercise is my demonstration and an extension of how I love myself. And so that's what I look at it now. Wow. So what was your experience like having the weight loss surgery? You know, some people are curious about it. Some people Mm -hmm. may be thinking about getting it or, Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they just don't have the knowledge of it. Cause you know, sometimes people don't have no understanding 
why did you get weight loss surgery? You didn't need that. All you had to do was work out. You know, everyone has yeah. these thoughts in their mind. Could you give them some type of knowledge so that they, they could be aware of it? Mm-hmm. So, so I, so I am not a typical weight loss surgery candidate in the sense that I could have lost it on my own, but I just got really frustrated and I decided to have the surgery because it's like a jump start. And so I look at weight loss surgery as just a jump start. It's just a way to help you lose the weight initially. But the thing about weight loss surgery is that if you don't combine it with other skills, you will regain the weight. Just like if you are choosing to use intermittent fasting, if you're choosing to lose weight by keto, whatever your method is, weight loss surgery is just another method. And so if you don't do something that will help you with keeping the weight off long term, you're going to gain it back. And so my experience with weight loss surgery was excellent, but I think it was excellent because I had already been practicing a lot of skills, meaning I knew how to eat properly. I knew how to exercise. Like I was a beast. I ran a marathon. I did a triathlon. I did all these things. And I wasn't raised as someone that was, I wasn't very athletic growing up, but I grew to love athletic things because it was just another lifestyle for me that I started enjoying. And so, but I had already incorporated all those things. And so the weight loss surgery was just another tool in my tool belt. It was just another way to help me on this journey. It wasn't, I wasn't relying solely on the weight loss surgery, just like I don't solely rely on keto or solely rely on intermittent fasting or anything like that. It's just a method that helps you in your journey. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. And you know, some people don't, they don't know that. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not aware of it at all. Mm-hmm. Some wow. people go into it and they want to rely just on the surgery. And if you rely just on the surgery, you are going to be in trouble. You will go, you're going to be in trouble because that won't be enough to keep you, especially if you're like me and there was any kind of compulsive behaviors with it. And so we kind of are getting into like the eating disorder type thing. If you are an emotional eater, like I was and can be sometimes if I'm not, you know, check, in check with it. If there's any kind of compulsive behaviors, then you have to really combine it with therapy. Like you need therapy. Mm-hmm. And Yeah. And so don't just, so I look at weight loss surgery as like a behavioral, a behavioral um, fix. It helps the behavior part of it, but there are a lot of cognitive brain stuff that we have to kind of work on too. And if we don't, then you'll still be in trouble. Yes, that is true. That mm-hmm. That's very true. <laughs> wow. So is it anything that you have coming up or anything that you would like to share with our listeners? Well, um, I do have a mommy retreat coming up. It's a mommy getaway for moms that are single new moms that need some support. Uh, We're going to get away for two days and three, no, it's going to be three days and two nights of fun, learning, and just pampering. So I have people coming in that will help us to learn about co-parenting and how to be the best co-parent, how to not forget about ourselves in our parenting, how to raise healthy, resilient kids with conscious parenting techniques, and how to, oh, you know what else I love? I have people that's coming in with financial planning and estate planning, but we're going to do a little bit of everything. We're going to paint and sip. We're going to do a little bit of everything. And so I'm really, really excited. It is Mother's Day weekend. And if people want to check out the itinerary, they can go on the website. It's bit.ly forward slash Courageous Moms Retreat, bit.ly forward slash Courageous Moms Retreat. That's going to be a lot of fun. I'm so, I'm really, really looking, looking forward to it. Nice. So in closing, what is something uplifting and inspiring you could share with our listeners? So I am, like my clients, (laughs) <laughs> they hear me, like I had a client tell me today, you know, I always hear you in my head every single day saying this one thing, and I'm going to say this now. So but my little catchphrase has become, show yourself grace. Show yourself grace. And what I mean by that is sometimes we are so 
freaking hard on ourselves. And we don't show ourselves any mercy. We don't cut ourselves any slack in any way. When we do that for so many other people, like we show people on the street, strangers on the street, more, more mercy, more grace than we show and allow ourselves. And that's not great. That's not healthy. So I want people to know that it is okay to show yourself grace. Be kind to yourself. Be mm-hmm. kind to yourself because that is how you grow. That's how you develop. That's how you become by being kind to yourself. You don't have to be a drill sergeant with yourself. Be kind. That's it. That's what I got. Drop the mic. Girl, <laughs> you said a mouthful. Especially being <laughs> kind to yourself because we always hard on ourselves and everything. It's so hard. Mm-hmm. We really are. Wow. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you. This is mm-hmm. very informative. I mm-hmm. enjoyed every moment of it. Yeah, I really did enjoy this conversation. I appreciate you for allowing me this space with you. You're welcome. We're going to have to do this again live, though. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Anytime. Let me know when. Yes, definitely. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Life Her Podcast, where we help heal women all over the world. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook, Life Her Podcast, and check out our YouTube page as well. And make sure you subscribe. You can also look onto our website and you can purchase merchandise and listen to the podcast episodes. I am Yvette Lloyd. I am Life Her. Love yourself, ladies. Take care of yourself and others you love dearly.